there's a crisis in the current models of physics. We have a consciousness that is part of the sea of consciousness. You're not just a drop in the ocean, you're the mighty ocean in the drop. You're not a physicist, and basically every sentence demonstrates that. A bunch of scientific sounding words sprinkled in with some spiritual new age words doesn't mean anything. Many scientists in the establishment have called me a fake, a charlatan, a fraud. But if there is going to be another extinction, it will be because of a science that is incomplete. What role do we play in the cosmos? Are we just an accident on a minor planet, a little speck of dust in a galaxy in the junkyard of infinity? Or are we indeed the universe looking at itself? Thanks so much, everybody. Have a seat, gentlemen. Doctors, doctors, have a seat. You are the universe. Well, first off, what made you, Deepak, what, what made you want to make a trailer that had your detractors in it, speaking quite, quite negatively about you? I think it's important to know that this is a controversy and that in many ways, uh, Dr. Kafatos was a cosmologist and quantum physicist, and I, we are challenging mainstream medicine. I'm sorry, mainstream science. I'm a medical doctor, he's a physicist. <laughs> So we are challenging the current ideas that there's a world out there which is independent of our experience of it. So how do you prove a universe that is independent of your experience of it? And Dr. Kovatos can tell you that one of the most um, prominent theories in quantum physics is uh, the Copenhagen interpretation, which says that without an observer, you can explain. Without the observer, basically, you don't have uh, any properties of the particles. So we say the particles make up the cosmos, right, everything. But without observation, even the idea of a distinct particle makes no sense. Very strange, but it is actually mainstream science in quantum physics. Is that essentially if a tree falls and, and no one hears or sees it, the tree, Correct. Does, the tree doesn't fall? Correct. There's no, it there's may fall, no, but no. <laughs> there's no sound in the absence of hearing. There's no form in the absence of seeing. Where is the sound heard in consciousness? Not in the brain, because all there is in the brain is chemicals, right? So how do we experience this? How do we experience this? How do we experience any sensation, image, feeling, thought, or sense perception? And when we say you are the universe, it's literal, it's based on the cognition of great seers who, the Sanskrit expression is aham brahmasmi, you'll understand that, I am the universe. I am is not the body-mind because even the body-mind is an experience in consciousness. There's nothing outside of consciousness. If there was, you'd never know about it. We could never prove it, we could never prove it. We could never prove it. And that is why we are the universe because the universe is what I perceive it to be almost, how I interpret it, The how universe, I... including your body and mind, is a combination of sensations, perceptions, images, feelings, and thoughts. So your universe and my universe, there are similarities, but it's not a dolphin universe, it's not a mosquito universe, it's not a crocodile universe. The universe of each species is different, and yet there's some leakage. Because if you have a, a relationship with your dog or your cat, uh, there's some emotional, spiritual connection. Even you have no idea what the dog or cat sees with their particular brain. Does that ex sort of explode the idea or break the idea of, a, of an objective universe or a universe that is made up of objective uh, qualities, qualities, the, particles, if you will. <laughs> the objective part is really also the subjective. There's an interesting complementarity, or if you like, uh, you know, the two together form the whole picture. 
you can't take one without the other. So even if the universe somehow existed without us, and I mean collective us being there, how would we know? How would you even know that the tree makes a sound or does not make a sound if no one is there? And I'm not talking about just human beings, no cats, no dogs, no wolves, no insects flying around. How would we know that the tree Ricky, makes sense? Ricky, how do we even know there are particles? We observe them, right? And then we give them names, Higgs boson. Higgs is the name of a physicist. Boson, Bos is also the name of a physicist. So there's an event in consciousness, we give it a name, and then we objectify our experiences as the physical world, including the physical body. So in the deeper reality, there's only consciousness in the physical body, the mind, and what we call the universe, are a unified activity in consciousness. Why is this important? Because if you understood that we are all kind of branches, differentiated, branches of a single consciousness, then we would automatically experience love and compassion and joy and equanimity and peace and our search for truth, goodness, beauty, harmony uh, would actually be facilitated by a deeper understanding of our innermost being. So if you look at all the great spiritual traditions in the world, the three things that are always uh, uh, part of experience, number one is called transcendence, going between subject-object split. Normally we think it's me and then the rest of the universe, but me is also an activity of the universe, right? So transcendence, going beyond subject-object split, the emergence of platonic truth, beauty, harmony, love, compassion, and the loss of the fear of death because consciousness is not in time. Only experience is in time. So awareness, right. awareness is beyond space and time. Awareness is beyond space, space and, time. and time. Because it's always, even this it's always space there. and time is an experience in awareness. All right, it's always there. So my, my question, and uh, <laughs> I'm interpreting this as we're talking. Uh, my, my question is, if I am the universe and the universe exists because I perceive it, does that then, then define God for me? Yes. Am I no, God? Uh, yeah, if you want to use that word, you have a divine intelligence which is overshadowed by your ego. So when we say I, we don't mean Ricky, right? Ricky is just an assumed identity as a result of cultural and social conditioning, even religious conditioning, economic conditioning. So that's your fragmented mind which is right now overshadowing the divine mind, where we are all one. So where, and that's the true meaning of love. So where is it? We're saying it's everywhere. It's actually in your everyday experience all the time. So exactly, Ricky, when you said I and the universe, it sort of implied a duality. We're saying beyond the duality, there is the awareness of everything being one. And it is in all of us, because when we go to sleep every night, it's, we don't have the same experience as we have in a waking state, do we? It's different. What about the person who, uh, it, who doesn't believe in objective truths that science has, has proven over the course? For instance, ev evolution, if you will. Like a person who says, that is not, I do not believe in that. That is not, that is not real. See, How this at has that nothing to do with belief. This has nothing. Belief can be a cover-up for insecurity. If I asked you, do you believe in gravity, you would say, that's ridiculous, right? Do you believe in electricity? That's ridiculous. Do you believe in consciousness or not? And if you say, I don't, then who says I don't? Who says I believe? It's the consciousness, right? So this doesn't contradict evolution at all. Evolution is a evolution of species of consciousness. We are a species of consciousness as human beings. There are other species of consciousness, crocodiles and dolphins and squirrels and bats. What does the world look like to a bat that only experiences the echo of ultrasound? They don't even have eyes. <laughs> okay, so it has a different universe, right? So we are a species of consciousness like branches of a tree. And at the source, there's only one consciousness. And if you want to call that God, that's fine. Or Ein Sof, or Brahman, or the ultimate truth, or 
pure consciousness. These are words that people have um, uh, used to describe the experience of unity consciousness. So in terms of the, of, the, of the oceans of the earth, there are these creatures, there are these fish, or very primitive, or whatever they are. They, they never seen the light of the sun. They have. They live in a constant temperature environment, very interesting, unlike here where you are. Their experience of consciousness or their own existence, awareness of their environment is different than ours for sure. They're as valid as we as ours. Why is really just ours ours the only valid ones? We're saying it includes everything. When we say you are the universe, we mean we collectively, you and I and everybody else. So consciousness is person specific, transpersonal, collective trans-species, and ultimately universal. So there's three levels of consciousness, uh, essentially. Yeah, many levels. Many levels. Many levels. Many levels. Every species has its own universe. So we, let, let's, let's start from the beginning. Um, there was a big, now. Uh, <laughs> big bang? <laughs> what did you, where, where did you start when you set out to, 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 to work together to write this? And, and what, was the, um, what was the process? Well, first of all, we're friends, right? So we yeah, we've to been together. friends for a long time. And Minas actually once came to a course that I did. Then we did several courses together. He's a physicist and a cosmologist and looks at uh, climate change and other things. And you know, if you look up the interpretations of quantum mechanics, there are about 25 of them. Uh, and yet quantum mechanics is a system of calculation which is very precise. What it means is controversial. So Menas happens to be one of the pioneers in his field, but he's also sympathetic to the, uh, the interpretations of the pioneers uh, like Niels Bohr and uh, Schrodinger and all the people who actually describe uh, quantum mechanics. So right now, as I said, there are 25 different interpretations. And he is, uh, you would say, a Copenhagenist, right? Uh, extending Copenhagen to the question of the observer, because that ultimately is, who is the observer? And I think we are sort of talking about that in the book. So you, 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 you're friends, you've worked together before, but where, what was the sort of starting hypothesis that you wanted to explore? That the universe is in you, the mind is in you, the body is in you. You, interacting with your own self, are the observer, the process of observation, and that which is observed, the seer, the process of seeing, that is also the scenery. There's only one reality. Now, if you look at the history of philosophy, there are two schools of monism. Everything is physical, everything is consciousness, and then the Descartes, Descartes view that there's mind and there's body. The problem with the dualistic worldview is if there's mind and body, then how do you do this? That's a thought, and this is a physical phenomenon, right? How does thought interact with uh, the physical reality? Or uh, how does experience occur in general? You know, all that's going right now into your eyes are photons, and they're going into your retina causing chemical reactions. What's going into your brain is an electrical current. What's happening in your brain is uh, electrochemical activity. But you're not experiencing electrochemical activity. You're experiencing this three-dimensional reality with color and sound in space and time. So that's called the hard problem of consciousness. It's a well-known problem. So you cannot explain mind by looking at matter. It's impossible, uh, and that you cannot even explain color. What is the redness in Deepak's uh, sweater? What or the blue in my shirt? What is that? Because all that's coming to your eyes is colorless photons. So this is called the hard problem of consciousness. And if you go, say, Google um, two questions, what are the two most open questions in science? One is, what's the universe made of? We don't know what the universe is made of. 70% is dark energy, 26% is dark matter, the remaining 4% is atoms, but of that 99.9% .9 is invisible interstellar dust, which is mostly hydrogen and helium, and the rest of the visible universe is 0.01%. That's 2 trillion galaxies, 700 
sextillion stars and trillions of planets, 0.01%. But when you look at atoms, they're made of particles, and particles are made of waves of possibility. So what's the universe made of? Nothing. This is the best answer we have, and yeah. possibilities. possibilities. Where do those possibilities exist? Where could they exist other than in consciousness? So consciousness doesn't have a form. The universe doesn't have a form. And yet, we experience this form. <laughs> That's the great mystery that is called the hard problem. We address this mystery in the book. We address everything, actually. What uh, was there before the Big Bang, how time came into existence, what is the origin of life. We talk about evolution. Mm -hmm. We talk about the evolution. evolution. So we, it, nothing we say is contradicting standard science. We're just saying standard science is incomplete without asking who's doing the science. Where are theories constructed or conceived in consciousness? Where are experiments designed in consciousness? Where are observations made in consciousness? And that's the one constant of all constants that we all ignore. Why do you think that we ignore it? Because... Habit. Uh, huh? Habit. Habit and conventional science. So we are basically uh, saying convention science is incomplete without addressing who's the observer. And we're only looking at that which is observed. But there's three things happening in every observation. There's an observer, there's a process of observation, that which is observed. Always, always three. And all those three are activities of consciousness. What is the, uh, how do you scientifically explain consciousness? Because you can explain the chemicals and everything that is sort of chemically happening in your mind and in your body, but- Actually, we don't explain even the chemicals. All we, all we see, as Deepak was just saying, is certain patterns, certain phenomena that we say, we give them names, we call them chemical reactions, electromagnetic reactions, but we don't explain the uh, very experience itself. We cannot, we don't even explain what is read. Chemicals so are human constructs they're human that we constructs. have given to experience. So we are human beings, and this is a human universe. But it doesn't mean it's the only universe there is. It means now, from an elevated point of view, is that we are the universe. It means everything. And sure enough, humanity is at the center of this universe. But it's also everywhere. So Ricky, look at this, OK? So if I ask somebody, what is this? They'd say it's the picture of the book, right? But that's a concept. What is it if you don't use a concept? It's blue, it's a shape, it's a color, it's a form. The rest is a story, a human story. You think a dog looking at that would say that's Deepak's and Menas's book? No, but it would have the experience, some experience. So when we, when we label experiences and we uh, give them descriptions, in a way we have created our concept of reality. Reality is just raw experience and the consciousness in which that experience is happening. And that experience is species specific. You know, a chameleon's eyeball swivel, swivel on two different axes. You can't even remotely imagine what this room looks like to a chameleon. Or a bee. Or a bee or a bat, you know, which navigates through the echo of ultrasound. No idea what, the, what is the universe to a bat. So we assume that the universe we see is the way it is. The picture of the world is not the look of it, it's our way of looking at it. There's no such thing actually as the picture of the world. It's only in our minds. The picture, the picture of the world is only in our minds. Wow. Uh, I'm going to open up to the audience for some questions. <laughs> Hi. Um, thanks so much for being here. And uh, I can't wait to read the book. So I just wanted to ask about, uh, so in our daily lives, what are the things that we can do to kind of tap into this awareness that you're talking about? So I'll try something with you right now, okay? As you're listening to me right now, turn your attention to who's listening. And that's you. That's your presence in which this experience is happening. So in spiritual traditions, they say, what good does it do a man to gain the whole world but lose his soul? A soul is a religious word, but it means literally your core consciousness without which 
there would be nothing that we could call an experience. So even if you do some contemplative practices like who am I, you'll slowly realize you're not the body-mind because the body-mind was different when you were a baby. It was different when you were a teenager. It's different now. 20 years from now, it'll be different. But the presence in which that experience is happening is the same, and that's you. And it's so immediate that we don't pay attention to it. We ignore it because it's so part of us. It's like a fish in water looking for water. Next question. Hello, over here. <laughs> Hi. So I was just wondering, um, when did you both like get into this type of, oh, I want to learn more about like how the universe works and different things about different things. And <laughs> um, basically, I also want to know if um, you guys went to school, what did you study? Because I'm in like the scientific field now, and like a lot of this brings me back to what I like think about when I'm in class and stuff like that when I'm talking to my professor. And yeah. It's a lifelong quest for both of us, but he's a yeah. physicist. So it's a good point you brought up. Uh, definitely when we interact with students, uh, these issues come up. And uh, from my point of view, and I believe Deepak's point of view, is to really just uh, ask the right questions and have that interaction between the teacher and the, the professor and the students. If we don't ask the right questions, we're going to get for sure the wrong answers. And so one, one big part of the scientific inquiry is to ask the right questions. And I think the, the question we're asking here, behind the, the title, you're the universe, is who am I? Who am I? And the answer is, you're the universe. If you don't ask the question, who am I? You're not going to get the answer. And be bold enough to question dogma, because you know, that's the history of science. No hypothesis has ever stayed there permanently. Uh, in fact, if you can't falsify a hypothesis, it's not good science. Would you say that one of the reasons that you wrote this book was to sort of change the, the dynamic between us being the smallest piece of the universe, and it, which is all, always can feel a bit nihilistic, and sort of making us feel as if we are the largest part of the universe ourselves? Yes, but be careful what you mean by we. Me. It's not your body-mind, because that too is an experience in consciousness. So yes, once you go beyond the ego, then you're a formless being experiencing yourself as form and phenomena, which also includes your body and mind and the universe as a unified activity. That's a very spiritual experience, you know, because when you know that and that your real self is not in time, then there's no fear of death as well. Death happens to experiences, not to the presence in which those experiences come and go. So when you say the smallest and the largest, actually in science we know the smallest and the largest are really the same thing. It's just that we identify with certain range of space and time and we call that our reality and then we enclose ourselves in our reality and then we're lost because we intuitively know that we're not just that. If you go inward in the atom, you end up with boundless universe. You go outward, you end up with boundless. So as is the atom, so is the universe. This is part of the perennial philosophies of humanity. She has a question. <laughs> Take over, Deepak. <laughs> no, um, but she's been standing for a long time. So hello, doctors of Prime Capitals. A pleasure to have you here. I'm Anna. Um, I was wondering what forces what energy of the universe are manifested through our current president, <laughs> Donald Trump, and what it means for the rest of the universe? Like, what kind of a experience? So, without getting like? political, every leader represents a collective consciousness. So, uh, whether we like the leader or not, that leader is a representation of our collective consciousness. And we can say, our collective consciousness is in conflict, it's in confusion, it's in chaos, it um, um, has a lot of bigotry and hatred right now, and the manifestation of that is a particular leader. But it's not the leader who's at fault. We have to search within and say, how can I be more peaceful? How can I be more loving? How, how can I get rid of 
the tendencies I may have for racism or bigotry or hatred or prejudice, um, egocentricism, narcissism, all of that. And once each of us takes that journey, the leader is not the leader anymore. Be the change you want to see in the world. <laughs> Mahatma Gandhi said that. Um, I think I have time for one more question. Who's got the microphone right here? Howdy, right, guys. Um, doctors, excuse Hi. me. Um, <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> um, so I sort of have like an interest in enlightenment, especially when you talk about Buddhists, like the whole culture and religion. I was wondering what kind of initial concepts out there that were floating around that you sort of gravitated to when you were trying to think up this uh, sort of initial concept you have about viewing the universe? So, if I may, um, all the concepts that you mentioned, the religious and spiritual, at their base foundation, they're the same. They all actually, more or less, say, give the same message, you are the universe, that's the eternal message. It's just that we have different languages, different traditions, and then we get confused by the wars, by the, by the languages and the traditions, and then we become enemies of each other. But really the message of all true spirituality is that we're all one. This is the essential religious experience. The description of the experience gets couched in ideology and dogma, and then people go to war. <laughs> you know, but as they say, my interpretation is better than yours. But uh, if we go to the root experience, the religious experience is the same. It's universal. That's what Aldous Huxley called the perennial philosophy. And that uh, um, is not only found in the sages of the Upanishads. It's found in Christian theology, in uh, Sufism, in Islam, in Buddhism, everywhere. Judaism. Guys, I have to let you go. You are the universe. Is it on shelves now for, yes. for people to pick up? Today yes. is today. Well, Deepak Minas, thank you so much for being thank here. You. It's been a pleasure talking to you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.